told I never meant to own What you get it out for What you get it out for We die alone We'll all die young What you get it out for What you get it out from Snow glistening on the ledge Whiskey on the bed Shake it out on a cigarette I miss me when I hear So bad if he cries in his sleep While the earth turns And his kids learn to say forget you They don't love you Does the devil get scared if she dies in her dreams Where the earth burns She cries cause she's nothing like you She Shalom, everyone. Shalom. I want to welcome everyone to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. I'm Elder Michael Johnson over here with the, the lost sheep of Israel with King James Bible University. And I want to make sure, um, actually I have to turn something off, but I want to make sure that everybody understand um, as we building on top of, on keep going, building on top of these teachings, it helped bring you closer to what is required of us to get into the kingdom of God. And before we get started with this teaching here, I do have a couple of announcements and then I know they'll be putting them in. Today we will be having uh, the, the language of biblical law class. That will be today at three o'clock Pacific time, five o'clock central and six o'clock Eastern time. 
that we'll be going through. We're going to be, um, I believe the homework already went out. And what I'll be doing, we're going to do an overview of the homework to see what's required to make sure this can be completed. And based on the information that was given to you in the email. So we will be uh, doing that. And that's today. So in um, sister, um, sister Venus will probably be putting that notice in there. So you guys will be getting the link for that to make sure you can come into class today. We also have where we're looking at, oh, foolish Galatians. That will be shown over. Uh, we're going to be going through that tomorrow. We'll be looking at that um, uh, King James Bible University of Houston and Chicago. They, uh, they, they, they have other engagements he had to take care of. So with that, we will be doing this one here. And that'll be over at... Um, from Sinai to the day, we have a channel where it's from Sinai to the day. If you ever seen it, you can go to King James Bible University YouTube homepage. You'll see it at the bottom to where you can join that to where you can catch that. This is going to be a very interesting teaching because it's going to show you what one that Christians love to use is Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 they love using that and we're going to find out what the basis is and we're going to go through it in detail to show you exactly what that means then the following week we're going to be looking at another one and we're going to be doing this one at king james bible university and this here we'll be looking at that one even closer we'll be looking at that one even closer because we're going to be going through that one in a lot of details and with that, we're going to be dealing with deathbed repentance. You have a lot of people where you have, they come to people and the Christians love to come to hospitals and they'll visit and they'll use John three sixteen. And the first thing they'll say, once the people agree to it and they'll sit there and they'll come walk away and say, these people are saved and they're going to heaven. We're going to take a close, close, close look at that. We're going to be looking at it. We're going to go through the precepts of the Bible. We're going to see everything in there that we need to see to understand it and making sure there's deathbed repentance. And that's what we have at the Christian game. We want to look at that in detail. So that's another part we're going to go through. And then the same thing is um, people, people responded with a great deal with this one. And it's now on sale with, um, with Amazon. And then we also, well, I don't know, I think I am out, but <clears throat> we do have the uh, unique, rare and unique Hebrew baby names. And um, if you haven't had a chance, uh, you can look at it. People who have gotten it, they, they really enjoy it. But the main thing is, this is the reason why, and I want to kind of explain in detail before we get started. The reason why they're rare and unique, many people don't know during the Atlantic slave trade, what they did, they'll they're, they're label, they'll get the names of our people. They'll have it. Sometimes they'll spell it with a J and some they did with a Y. But I, rep I put everything back in the correct perspective that it should be. But you can actually go directly to Atlantic slave trade. You'll actually see the names, the same names you'll see in the book. But you'll see with these unique names, these names is pretty much so unique they pretty much unfounded now are being used. But what I was able to do over the course of a couple of years, what I did, I restored all the meanings to these names, which is really a beautiful thing. If you really go to go and uh, see the book. Now people is looking at what shocked me. We have a lot of people looking to change their own names based on what they see. But what you want to do is look in there Especially, you know, people who might be young and getting ready to have children. One of the great things to get. Look at that. It'll help you out a great deal. But now you'll know exactly what that name means. And this is going back from where they came from, the homeland, even though we got kicked out. So with that, hopefully you guys can sit there and you can get part of, be part of that. But what we want to do, we want to focus on here. In... And, 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 and with this, and I only used the picture of uh, Miss Miss Turner because I know she just passed. And, and I used to listen to a lot of her music. But the main thing is she she made that song, What Love Got to Do With It. 
But we want to focus on that. We want to look at that. And it tells us he loved Jacob and hated Esau. And this was presented to me by one of the sisters because she, she was trying to figure out the differences between the two and really kind of get underneath it and really find out what it was about. Legitimate question. Legitimate question. And it has to come with an answer. As First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 tells us that we have to get a reason of our hope. And we have to find this in the Bible. So I want to take everybody. I want to make everybody understand something right here. He, he loved Jacob and hated Esau. So the same thing as I do most times, I want everybody in here to be actively participating in what's going to happen. Because this is the only way you can sit there. Besides sitting back, you can actively see what happened. You might participate in the chat or you might participate with self. Either way is fine. Either way is fine. But make sure you actively participate. And if you're going to do it with yourself and you're not going to put it in the chat, be honest with yourself. Be honest. Don't sit there and change it after we go further with it. Oh, no, I'm going to change. No, I, this is what I really No, Don't change it. Can we all agree on this before we start up? Because this is going to get <clears throat> hot, heavy and serious pretty quick. But I just want to make sure all of us can sit there and, and understand where I'm coming from. And we got a lot of eyes coming in. So I want to take this point. I want you to imagine something. I want everybody to imagine a scenario. I'm going to put forth a scenario to you. And I want you to clearly find out what is happening here. So let's imagine for a moment this scenario. That individuals and let's say people or you for instance you love this artist this this singer you love this singer you love them and you acclaim there you're their biggest fan you you the biggest fan of them all you express your admiration, your passion, stating how you adore every song, every, lind every lyric that's penned by this artist. I want you to keep this in mind. Every, everybody with me so far. See, I want you to sit there and say, everybody so far, they, they, they have this artist, whoever it is. You ain't got to say what, I, but just say, I have an artist. This, I just want you to imagine that you got this artist. And you're the biggest, biggest, biggest fan. Ain't nobody bigger than you. And you express your admiration, your passion, your passion. And you, whatever they pin, you love. <laughs> they pin it, you love it. I want everybody to stay with me. Because we all on this boat together. So now we got everybody. So everybody got this in their head. That's all I want you to have in your head. Now. <clears throat> This is the catch. Now watch what happens with this catch. Now we claiming they we they we their biggest fan, but we, I'm, I'm see I'm included in this. We we don't we don't but we do something oddly, but oddly we don't listen to the artist's actual original music. We don't listen to the original music because I'm gonna go somewhere on this. Instead. We choose to play a distorted version of the song. We alter the lyrics of the song and we claim it suits our taste better. I want you to stay with me on this because this is what's going on. We, 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 we disregard the artist's designated concert dates. We disregard those concert dates. We, we don't worry about those. But we are choosing instead to host our own events that we consider is better. Now, my question is, to each and every one of us, would we be considered a true fan? That's a question you can ask for yourself or you can answer to yourself. You can put it in the, in the chat. <clears throat> 
if you do all these things, you alter the songs, you 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 don't you alter the dates, you do the do we say we're true fans? Keep right right on time. Yeah. Yeah. So now this shows what our real love is. What our real love is. This shows our real love, our appreciation towards this artist. They're sitting there saying, why, why is he saying this? Because I'm saying the same thing. Hold me to the same thing. So don't worry. Everybody putting in time. But I want you to understand something. I want you to see what's really, really what's going on. So let's look at this. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go to scriptures. So we done altered everything. And it's similar to when the people profess they love God with all their hearts, all their mind, all their soul. Yet the actions contradict their words. <laughs> and you follow me? They alter the Sabbath day to fit their convenience. They consume foods deemed unclean. They didn't did all these things. They, they, they host solemn assemblies contrary to his desires. Let's look at something. <laughs> so the Most High is saying the same thing. Let's look at this. In, in, in Amos, Amos chapter 5, and we're going to look at this in uh, verse 21. He, he, he tells us it. He says, uh, I hate, I despise your feast days. I will not smell your solemn assemblies. You see how he's putting this. But it gets better. Oh, it gets better. It says, though you offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard your peace offerings of your fatty beasts. Verse 23. Take thou away from me the noise of thy song, for I will not hear the melody of thy vows. <laughs> exactly. I hate, I despise your feast days. I would not smell your psalmist assembly. So this showing you the similarly vain things where people who profess they love God in their heart, their mind, and their soul contradicts the word. Loving God isn't merely about professing or love or professing love. It involves an adherence to his commands to respect his desires. Just like a child showing love for their parents. Merely the words but their actions in respect for their wishes and adhering their values holds dear to this parent and they're supposed to be holding to it. So God love for us is evident in its enduring patience and mercy. Despite our transgression, he remains steadfast. Much like the forgiving parent who continues to love their wayward child. So something comes to the question. So we come to the question pretty quickly. We'll see this in Malachi chapter 1 and verse 2. It's telling us this. It says, I have loved you, saith the Lord, saith the Spirit of God. He said this. I have loved you. Yet ye say, yet we say, when have you loved us? So he responds. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. <laughs> I only laugh because this is this is this is typical us. His love is present in every sunrise, every breath we take, in the promise of his enduring presence. Without being said, however, 
Love is not a one-way street. It involves exchanging mutual respect. If we accept God's gesture of love but neglect our obligations to him, are we being fair? Are we aligned in accepting a friendship or a friend's help whenever we need, but failing to offer our assistance when they are in need? So I want you to keep these all in mind. Keep all this stuff in your mind. In John chapter 14, <laughs> Christ speaking through Yahweh, Shah, Jesus, speaking to us. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. This verse is clearly expressed and illustrates that love for God is not shown. It's not shown. <clears throat> but it's something that we have to see and make sure we understand what's going on here. It's just not shown in words, but it's shown in action and obedience. Of his commandments professing our love for god must align with our actions our love for god must be shown in our actions we cannot claim to love god yet live contrary to his commandments in doing so we are not expressing love rather we are demonstrating an unbalanced relationship that one would accept in our human relationship I want you to keep this in mind because should we accept the relationship doing so? We expect to be acceptable in our relationship with God. Do, do, is that real true? So today we got to examine this intricate tapestry. We got we to we we examine this. This divine word, this word called love, woven through the golden thread of promise, the unspoken covenant, terms this at the heart of our exercise, resonating the same with the comic disharmony, this faith and belief, the core of God's love radiating across eons, hangs on upon wavering and sturdiness of a promise. So we got to find out what this is. We have to find out what all this is and what all this is talking about. <clears throat> we got to see what this is This is doing. So we got to find out what love is made of. This is what we're going to find out. What love is made of. So the term love, and make sure, please make sure you have your pencils and paper to where you can write all this information down as we're going to, we're going to go through this in detail on what it is. To where you would never be fooled upon this. Because the term love, as we dive deep into the biblical understanding of love, love is the highest form of selflessness. It's the highest form of selflessness. It's unconditional love. So when people just roll around, oh, I love you. No, you better understand what you're talking about. Because that has the highest form of selflessness. It's used to describe God's love for us. It's right there. See, in this love, we are called to imitate our relationship with others. Let's look at John now. Um, chapter first John chapter four. We want to Take this over here at verse uh, 11. We're going to look at this. It says, Beloved, promise once. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. See it right there. Right there in front of us. Love is made of Empathy. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Love is made of empathy. And I'm gonna explain. You, I'm gonna explain a lot of this stuff in detail for you. So since it's in empathy, empathy is is a profound ability to understand. That's why it's so important. 
it's the profound ability to understand and to share feelings of others. It's the compassionate thread that weaves hearts together. Empathy. Empathy has the capacity to understand or feel the other person experience at their point of view often describes as ability to put oneself in another's shoes. That's why empathy, when people sit down and try to empathize with others, and especially they of another nation, most of the time they can't really do that. But they'll sit there and say they can't, and that's not true. We have to be able to recognize their feelings. Empathy is complex. It's a complex phenomenon we can actually look at, consisting of multiple components. And I want to make sure you write these down. One is cognitive empathy. Cognitive empathy. We want to make sure we understand that. Because we, as we get down into the teaching, we're going to find out a lot of information that's going to help us out a great deal as we're doing this. So it refers to cognitive empathy. Empathy. It refers to the ability to, one, comprehend another person's perspective or mental state. That's what you want to understand. That's why some people can work so good with their children, because they can have the ability to comprehend another person's perspective or mental state. That's why they take the time with their child. So thinking, part of empathy, where we are intellectually understanding what someone is going through. Love. Love also have an emotional and effective empathy. Emotional and effective empathy involves sharing feelings with others. If someone is sad and their sadness make you feel sad also. You're experiencing most emotional empathy. It's the feeling. The part of empathy is where we feel very deeply to respond to someone else's emotions. It's love. Compassionate empathy. Compassionate empathy. It's part of love. Compassionate empathy. Most of us see it as empathetic concerns and that's not but it goes beyond the understanding of others it's experience and sharing their feelings it involves feeling moved by others suffering and wanting to help alleviate the problem so for us to understand the functioning of empathy we can understand it in a few ways meaning meaning this perception is one Perception, empathy begins with the accurately perceiving the emotions of others. That's your key, perception. This might come from uh, explicit cues that come from people. Like when someone says or how they say it. Takes very acute watching, listening. How people say things or how they say it. Those are cues, body language, cues. That's something I learned very good at an early age and continue and continue to learn. Perception. And you see this perception is essential. It's a really essential part of empathy. I'm going to show you something, make sure we can get some of this. Um, We're going to look at Luke and I want to take you to Luke. And look at Luke chapter 10. And we're going to park over here at verse 33. Actually, it's already highlighted. It says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. You see what's going on. So I want you to imagine that. So imagine this, the heart of this, this bustling city, like this thriving city. There's a homeless man there, day in, day out, day in, day out. People pass by this same man. But when they pass by, they're absorbed in their thoughts, their own worries, their hurry to reach their destinations. They see him, but they truly 
don't see him. His suffering, his needs, his despair etched in his eyes all remain unnoticed to everybody. Then one chilling winter morning, this woman comes by. So we'll call the woman, we'll give her a name. We'll just say her name is Sarah. And she's a local cafe owner. We'll just put that in there. We'll throw all these little mixes in there. Just like others see this homeless man in multiple times, but unlike others, she paused in her tracks at this time. She noticed this man. Threads of clothes barely hanging on. Says, and we're gonna call the guy. We're gonna get a guy name. Let's call the guy name Ben. We just say Ben. First thing come to mind, Ben. <clears throat> so she notices Ben. From the harsh winter, <clears throat> excuse me. His uh, sunken eyes reflecting in this merciless cold. She sees him. She re, she she really sees him in his suffering. So in that very moment, Sarah heartfelt with compassion, just like the Samaritan woman, just like the Samaritan even in here. She invites a homeless man to her cafe, offers him a warm meal, hot coffee, sits him, listens to his stories, and acknowledges his existence as a, as a person. Her actions inspired by no other than empathy. By empathy, she recognizes his suffering, not only provide immediate comfort, but she ignited a glimmer of hope of this homeless man in a desolate world. Right up front. So this mirrors the Samaritan act, even in this biblical verse. So we can see this truly that someone not just look at them, but allows herself to acknowledge that feels their suffering. We can extend empathy and provide comfort in big and small ways, just like Sarah did. All this, we're going somewhere. Because we're going to come back to that. We're going to go back to where we originally was in. In perception, we can also find this in Wisdom of Solomon. <clears throat> we see this in Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 3, <clears throat> in verse 9. They that put their trust in him shall understand the truth. You, you see how he's putting this. They that put their trust in him shall understand, shall understand the truth, including such as be faithful in love shall abide with him for grace and mercy is in is to his saints and he hath cared for his elect. Like the Samaritan. This is interesting. It's really interesting, isn't it? I know it's getting really, really interesting now. But the main thing we're going to do, perception and understanding another's condition. That's what we want to know. To where we put our trust. We're going to understand the truth. Such be faithful in love and abide with him. Grace and mercy is to the saints and the elect. So perception and understanding, perception and understanding, these two critical words here, this verse invites us to trust God. This trust, this trust is an act of surrendering control. And you're going to leap into faith. We relinquishing our control and we leaping on faith. So it's just like we trust in a friend's secret. So when, when we trust the friends with a secret or trust the surgeon in our lives on the operating table, we go from our need to control the outcome into trust in the abilities of goodwill and intentions of others. Everybody understand me? This is the same thing as people have a hard time even flying. Because they have this such a need of control, they have to surrender that. This is why a lot of people don't even like to fly. And if you're going to die, you're going to die. You can't change your time. You cannot change that. So you might as well get on the plane. Because if you're going to die, you'll die on the ground just as easy as in the air. 
So that's the problem that we have. So we have to sit there and we have to let go of this control and have the abilities and goodwill and intentions of others and just let it go. To understand the truth. Understand the truth is what he's saying. To understand the truth. Same right there in Wisdom of Solomon. He should understand the truth. It's the part where we have surrendered our trust. We start this gap, this reality of life. It's more profound perspective. Like we trust in the laws of gravity. You understand why the apple fall from the tree. In a spiritual sense, it refers to the realization and wisdom that comes with faith. Think about it. As we tearing this verse down in Wisdom of Solomon, same thing. Same thing. He's not changing nothing. It says, such as be faithful in love shall abide with him. How can we see this? It tells us the same thing. It tells us that we are consistent in love for God. We find ourselves in a state of peace, harmony. Imagine a loving relationship or a friendship where you're always, you're always there for each other. The sense of security, abiding with each other. That's what this verse is pointing to. This is why it tells you more right there. This is why it's more there. It says, for grace and mercy, is to his saints, and he have cared for his elect. Think about that. See, this reinforces God's tender regards for those who seek truth, shows consistent love, who trust him. Just like the parent I said earlier, the parent with this unconditional love and concern for their child. See, this is the same thing where God extends his grace, his mercy, his care, is always connected to his faith, and love. So this understanding, it guides us to adopt a perspective of trust, understanding and consistent love and faith and ensures that in doing, in doing so, we can look after and care for. So we got it by the grace of God. is isn't about a blind belief, but it's about adopting an attitude. We'll say it again. This is not about a blind belief, but adopting an attitude a love, trust, faith towards life. And the main part is the God of Israel that governs it. We got to be able to do one thing, processing. We need processing in our life. That, 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 that's a must be able to conceive and understand the emotions that we perceive. This can involve remembering when we felt the same way using our same cognitive skills to imagine what it would be like processing 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 and feeling like you required to where you be like experiencing actually we're gonna tell you what let's go here let's go somewhere we 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 look at this in romans chapter 12 in verse 15 I want to show you this to see something because processing we can see this in here it says rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep what yeah it's there it's rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that, that weep let's, okay let's look at something Let's look at something. Um, uh, let's just do this. Uh, yeah. Let's say, let's say, let's say we have a person. We'll use Annie. Annie. We'll use Annie. And Annie is a nurse. Everybody got that. Annie's a nurse. And, and, and what she, she's a well-loved, well-respected in her ability and connected to her patients for her, like her personal level. But one day, a new patient this new patient comes in. Name is Ella. And, and Ella is admitted to her care. And Ella is admitted to her care. This young woman is battling a terminal illness. Ella. So despite the heavy burdens of her diagnosis, 
Ella remains a beacon of positivity, continuously celebrating any type of small victory. I don't care what type of victory it was, she she celebrated. In her fight against this this disease, this terminal illness disease. Despite the heavy burdens, she stayed to it. So when Ella finishes her first round of of whatever she had to go through, chemotherapy, whatever it is, Anna shares her joy. 100% with she'll share it. She arranges many celebrations with, hey, she, hey, you got through it. She, she'll do these and balloons, cakes, and they're just rejoicing with her accomplishment. Hey, bring her in cupcakes and hey, hey, you did this. Do all of these things. Same thing is telling you right here in, in Romans 12, 15. It rejoice with them that rejoice that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Why is this so profound? Why is this so profound? Because one, what it did as weeks pass, weeks pass, Ella, Ella health started to go down quickly. And she, she begins to lose her once vibrant spirit and her eyes reflecting this profound sorrow. Rather than offering empty platitudes, Anna sits with Ella, sharing her sorrows. So holds Ella's hands, not shying away from her tears, listening to her fears, her heartache, and she embodies this, the same part. She's weeping, that same second part. Weep when they weep, when they weep, that weep. So this example shows you that this verse is it truly connects to another's emotion, celebrating their joys, sharing their sorrows, requiring us to understand their experience and responding with empathy. It evolves an emotional process, stepping outside of one's own perspective and meeting others right where they are. Right where they are. Processing. Yeah, um, let's move forward because we want to we want to build we building on something here. I want you to see this, and Sirach, because because this love and promises has a lot to do with this. In Sirach, chapter twelve, and we're gonna look at verse one and two, and we're gonna do this one also. When thou do good, know to whom thou doeth it. So shalt thou be thanked for thy benefits. Do good to the godly man, and thou shalt find recompense. And if not from him, yet from the Most High. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse. You see, it's the same thing. You can consider even each and every one of us. We can consider ourselves like a businessman. Known in our own community for our own generosities. Just keep it that way. So one day we go to this local school operating on a shoestring budget. This school is operating on a shoestring budget. And and we, we approach this to, to, to assist them to refurbish, say, their library. We're just going to refurbish just the library area. And as we go in there, people will be touched by the dedication of the children so as we agree to help, now as we align with the wisdom, when thou doest good, know to whom thou doest it. That's why he's telling us that. When you do good, know who you're doing it to. Just don't do it just to be showing you can do something. This is the stupidest thing most of us do. He doesn't merely write a check. Instead, he even gets involved himself in the project, understanding what this, this need is, spending time with the staff, spending time with the children, becoming familiar with those who benefit from the same aid that you provided. Then this becomes part, do good to the godly man, and thou shalt find recompense. When it's not from him, yet it's from the Most High right there so as we contribute to this library project not expecting any form of materialistic reward 
from schools or anything. That's what we should be doing. Not inspecting anything. The gratitude that comes with it, we should just be looking from the, the joy that he sees from the children's faces. They walk in their new library, the gratitude of the teacher's eyes, the satisfaction the experiences making this difference of this recompense, this spiritual enjoyment. The fulfillment that comes from aiding these dear hearts. So this shows us right here. This this grand scheme of things, we feel more closer connected to the Most High God. His experience of this spiritual growth, this contentment, this sense of purpose, these towards now, not from the school or the community, but for the alignment of a higher purpose of our spiritual principles. So the same essence of Sirach chapter 12, verse uh, verse 1 and 2, it shows us this. To where we need to be able to discern the differences. Understanding what's going on. There's true rewards, such as these actions. Not often material, or, or but spiritual things. The sense of purpose. The deeper connection with the divine God. The personal spiritual growth and the same story that can encapsulate each and every one of us shows that wisdom is there perfectly. So we want to understand the inner workings of love. And that's all we've been building on, understanding what love is. And you're seeing it in, this, in these pieces. So the same thing is the response, our emotional response. It can range from mirroring the, the emotions, like feeling sad when someone else is sad. So the feeling is distressed that someone else is pain or even feeling compassion to desire to help. So our emotional response is manifesting as compassion, the desire that that, that is a, a serious part of, of empathy. In First John, it shows us that. In First John, we we'll see that there. First John chapter three, verse seventeen. But whoso hath this world good, but whoso hath this world good, and seeth his brother have need, and sheddeth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him. Each way we're one of us have to think about that. Each and every one of us has to think about that. I don't care how we look at it, how we see it, how you flip it. How is empathy evident in you? Whoso had this world's goods if you have this world's goods and seeth his brother in need that have need and sheddeth his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Something for you to think about. This is something I personally want you to think about. See, don't sit there, oh yeah, this is me. No. You think about that. Actually, I'm gonna build. On, I'm gonna build on that because, because this here, a lot of people we love to sit there and say we do this, we do that, we do this, we do that, but but it's telling us we looking these that directly now. We can't get around them. We looking directly at it. In in Tobit chapter four verse verse uh, sixteen, verse sixteen, I want you to see something. Actually, it's already highlighted too. Watch, watch how this, watch how this plays out. It says, "Give thy bread to the hungry, give bread to the hungry, and thy garment to them that are naked, and according to thy abundance, give arms, give these good deeds, and let not thy eyes be envious when thou giveth arms. Pour out thy bread on the burial of of the just, but." Give nothing, give nothing, give nothing to the wicked. <clears throat> I 
I ain't, I shouldn't even have to talk on it because it's, I'm going to be cool. Give nothing to the wicked. And they're going to give to the wicked tomorrow. They're going to give to the wicked tomorrow. That I promise you. And they're going to give to some wickets today. Not just tomorrow. They're going to give to a lot of wickets today. So while empathy is the typical perceived that this has a positive trait, negative outcomes in certain circumstances, it's important to understand that these negative aspects do not necessarily mean empathy. Are you, are you with me? They don't necessarily mean empathy. It's a harmful trait, but rather it illuminates the potential pitfalls when coupled with wisdom and discernment, our boundaries, we, 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 we have a few examples of them. Love is made up of making poor decisions when they do that. Making poor decisions. Understand when you're making poor decisions, saying it's empathy. Poor decisions. You can be you can be over wound with, 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 with burnouts, being highly, highly, highly empathetic can sometimes many lead people to emotional overwhelm or burnout and continuous to take emotions or problems and, and have these things. One of the most common ones is caregivers. Did you know that? It can get burnout. Let me show you something. Um, we'll go here. Uh, let's go to Exodus. We're going to go to Exodus chapter 18. And we're going to see something here. We're going to go to 18. We're going to go to 18, 13. We're going to read this down. And it came to pass on the morrow. Moses sat and judged the people. He talked to people. Why? Based on empathy. But it's going to say, And the people stood by Moses from morning until evening. When Moses, when Moses' father-in-law saw that he did to the people, he said, what is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone and all the people stand by thee from morning until evening? Why are they doing this? And Moses said unto his father, father-in-law because the people come unto me to inquire of God and when they have a matter they come unto me and I teach between the matter I teach one and another and make them know the statutes of God and his law and we'll see it's Moses' father-in-law said unto him, This thing thou doest is not good. This is not good. It's not good, dude. It's not good at all. Jephro, a child from Midian, from Ketra, he's telling you, it's not a good thing. But he gets better. Oh, he gets better. Thou surely wear away, both thou and thy, this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able. Thou art in your perfection and beauty not able to carry or to perform it thyself alone. Can't do it. Can't do it. I want you to look at something. I want you to think of something because I want to give you. I want to give you silhouette pictures. So I want you to consider a man. I don't care what man. Put anybody. Consider a man. He's a. He's a. He's a. A passionate founder of an organization aimed in providing education to underprivileged children, like Moses. He feel profound in the sense of duty towards children his organization serves. So he involves in every aspect, every nook and cranny of his organization. 
from fundraising, curriculum, planning, hiring teachers, connecting with local communities and families. Over time, he's burdened in handling all tasks. All. These tasks start weighing him down on this man. He finds himself overworked, overwhelmed. His health starts suffering. He's initially, his essential passion start dwindling. He feels aligned like Moses who was buckling under the strain. Single-handedly addressing all Israelites' disputes, observing the man struggles, this guy will say Anthony. Long-time friend who is a mentor steps and reminisce that same thing we can say the same with what Jephro did in Moses. So Anthony advises his friend to share this workload with others in 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 his organization, saying, "Remember, you 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 can't do all this on your own. You got to delegate some of these tasks." You have to. And just because you delegate them, less doesn't mean you 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 any less valuable. So as he continued to advise him, he started to start delegating these responsibilities. He's appointed teams and handling fundraising and others to oversee curriculums, planning, and start doing all these things. The act of delegating was not only enlightened the workload, but to bring the also new ideas, new energy into the organization to help thrive even more. So the same thing, when we're looking at things like this or just saying something or building something on that, we can learn leadership isn't about doing everything yourself, but it's empowering others by sharing the workload that ensures this organization sustainability and our own well-building, our own well-being, is continue to support with these children that we were serving. So the same thing as we see right here in Exodus chapter 18, verse 13 through 18, leads us to wisdom, humility, and courage. But then we have these poor decisions that you can see actually, if you ever want to read it, because I'm not going to go through the whole thing, I might I was going to go through some parts, but the same thing, you want to see that poor decisions Empathy for a person or a group so strong can cloud your judgment, can lead to poor decisions or unfairness, which can, which can result to fairness, favoritism, injustice, swayed by emotions, not by imbalance assessment, but just in those ways. Same thing we look at um, in um, 2 Samuel. When you look at 2 Samuel chapter 13, you can go and you can read that entire chapter. You can see with King David empathy, his empathy for his son Absalom. I want you to pay attention to what I'm saying. The empathy that he has for his son Absalom, despite Absalom's wrongdoings, led him still to make wrong decisions and eventually resulted into this discord and rebellion. Consider the same case. Consider the same case. When people do these, as you calling yourself an educator, overseeing small schools, and you had these students, that you have that always been obedient child and kind hearted, actively participating in school community service. So as part of a special incentive, this one kid he he was he was he was put charge of organizing or, or organizing this charity drive and meant to support these left privileged people in their community, the entire school community, including the students' parents and the staff, was enthusiastically contributing. However, over ensuring these weeks, these, these 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 discrepancies and all these things, the funds allocation emerged 
and the concerns that not all collected the funds reaching the intended beneficiaries. Upon through this this this, this thorough examination, the same person that you can put based on making poor decisions can put you in this kind of a problem. Can put you in a tough spot. Can make you confused based on your decision. Your test lies right there. Because you have to be able to separate his 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 partial affection for this moral and spiritual obligation of that position. So the same thing is what we'll get caught up in. And what a lot of us get caught up in is one of the big things that we have all the time is where we have what we'll call is is a manipulation in codependency. Manipulation in codependency. All this intertwines with love. We never got off of love, but I'm showing you the inner workings on what can happen, good decisions and bad decisions based on love. Because when we're looking at manipulation in codependency, empathetic individuals might become targets. Empathetic individuals can become targets for manipulative individuals who will prey on their capacity or to understand or for their understanding and forgiveness. This can lead to a toxic or codependent relationship happens too many times too many times and this is what happened because people think that this love is there and it's not so in this new dependence actually we're gonna tell you what let's 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 do something let's do something because i want to make sure people understand what's going on here in um second corinthians in second corinthians chapter 11 in verse 3 i want you to understand something I want you to clearly understand something. What's happening here? Because we we can sit there and people can be led astray for inter- for for individuals with malicious intentions. It's it's telling it says, but I fear at least by any means, as as the serpent guile beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. See, we got to remember this, what's happening here. Remember the video I showed you guys a while back about this guy, he, he called himself Shaul Yisrael. He did this. He, he thought he can beguile you on this. Some people got upset that we even showed the video. Some people got highly upset because I even did that. But, but even though I show you this, people are showing you these people is still in a state of disbelief. And they should be taken advantage of. In this instance, this critical to where we can recognize that issues that it don't lie with empathy itself, but rather how it navigates. Balancing empathy with discernment, wisdom, is is called a self-care. It is vital for it to remain positive and constructive trait. This is what we have to do, and this is how we got to understand it. That's why it's so important. We have to remember, <clears throat> everybody can agree with this. And if you don't, you can say no. But we got to remember, love, all of what I'm showing you what it is. Love is made of vulnerability. Love is made of a vulnerability. And I'm going to explain that to you. Love is made of vulnerability. Why? It's the willingness to expose oneself. It's willingness to expose one true self. To let another see your entire your entirety and your strength, your weaknesses and your triumphs, your failures. Let's 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 let, let me let me let me show you this and <clears throat> and see 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 what I'm talking about. And we find this in James chapter five in verse uh, verse sixteen. And this is why I said it, it's made up of this. It's made up of vulnerabilities. It says, confess your faults with one another. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. In effectual, fervent prayers for a righteous man, he much. <clears throat> you see right here, 
is right there. Another one you'll find right there with Second Corinthians. In Second Corinthians, we'll, we'll put them all together so we can get it. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And we'll see here. It says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, for that reason, I will rather glory in my infirmities that I may, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You see how he's saying this and how he's laying this out. For that reason, therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reapproaches in necessities in persecutions in distress for Christ's sake. For I, for when I am weak, I'm strong. For when I'm weak, I'm strong. You see, he's exemplifying his vulnerabilities but sharing his personal struggles and finding strength in his weakness. This is this is all day long. All day long on what we should have been doing, on what we do, knowing exactly what love is. In in Sirach chapter four, looking at verse twenty six, it's telling us even more so. Even more so. This is why God shows shares this with us. He says, that's why he says, I'm a jealous God. But he says, Be not ashamed to confess thy sins. Enforce not the course of thy river. So wherever way you're flowing, don't force it. But we try to go up river when the river is going down. Vulnerability is can also navigate outcomes that's not coupled with discernment. Why do I say that? Everybody can sit there and just say, I who remember, I might hear a couple of verses in it, you know, as I might speak about it, but we'll hear a couple of verses. But the main thing is I want you to want to tell you something. Exposure to manipulation to harm and being open about our thoughts, our feelings, our experiences sometimes makes us targets to those who would exploit our openness or for their gain. This is what people do. I tell you what, remember, most people remember the vulnerability of Samson and Delilah in chapter 16 of Judges. Most people remember that. Because the tale of Samson and Delilah, this riveting narrative about their love and deceit, this tragic downfall that he ended up having, perfectly illustrates the spiritual perils inherent to the vulnerability when it was exploited for the malicious intent by manipulation. Samson. Samson owned less divine strength. Same thing he did. His hair and his his uncut hair was what mainly think. I'm telling you again, what mainly made him think. I'm going to say this again, to mainly make him think. And many people even talk that the source of his power was in his hair. His physical, fleshly hair. That's the stupidest thing you can ever think of because that's not the truth. It was in a vow. It was in a vow. Actually, let, let, let's go here and let's look at this. And we'll go in Judges. We'll see this in Judges chapter 13, verse, verse 5. So the main thing, people believe it was in his hair. His hair carries a strength. Why would God put strength in hair? <laughs> I'm telling you, we can't make this stuff up. We can't make it up. But it's telling you right there, it says, Lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, this he's talking to he's talking to Samson's mom. It says, No razor should come to a head, for the child should be a Nazarite. He should be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver the Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. That was a covenant. He just broke the covenant. <laughs> That's all when she cut his head, he broke the covenant. It was, the covenant was broken. Not he took he took his power. He always had the strength, but that's that's another that's another story about everything else. Uh, let's go down a little bit. I want to show you something. Um, sixteen, sixteen, seventeen. We'll go here. Just just pick up a little bit. It says an angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, that's the dad. He said, though. Why did I detain me? I will not eat of thy bread. See, I'm not, I, don't, I don't need y'all knowledge. 
if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was a messenger of the Lord. He didn't know this. That's the point. Why, why are you trying to do me? You, you're doing the wrong one. You need to do the Lord. Well, he said, and Manoah said unto the angel, what is thy name? What, what in the hell are you asking me my name for? Why are you asking? Okay. And when thy saying come to pass that I may that I, I may do the honor. Are you serious? They ain't even talking. Why in the hell are you asking me my name? I done told you what. I'll leave this alone. I'll be done went off on another tangent. So this is the thing. So once Delilah knew the secret that she thought it was, because Samson knew this. Samson was told it, don't you can't never cut your hair because you have a you have a thing with the Lord, so you can't never cut your hair. And this is where all your strength is. Samson thinking I'm buffed out. This is my strength. This is my strength. She cut it. He didn't get small. He was still the same buffed out guy. But now he don't have and then he buffed out, but he don't have no strength. That showed you how much carnal he was. It cut, he weak. <laughs> He can sit there, do whatever he want to do, but guess what? You cut his hair, he think he weak. I can beat him up. And probably, probably he'll probably come blow on me and take me out. But I sit there and say, if I can cut this joker hair while he sleep, I make this joker think he weak and I can beat him down. And I really couldn't. <laughs> Just letting you know how crazy this can get. But the main thing it came to pass when, when, when we see this, that this now's right, then with the light of secret. See, and once she knew what the secret was, guess what she did? She betrayed him, leading him eventually to be captured, binding him, blinding, even unto death. Samson's strength was a divine gift from, from, from revealing the source that Delilah thought was his hair, and he believed it too. Same thing, how superstitious, how people talking about throwing salt over your shoulder, the spitting on brooms and all this craziness that they do. See, if you believe it enough in your own head, it becomes true. Because you believe it. Don't split a pole. I split, I'm the worst one to walk with down the street because I'm going to split a pole. Out of, I'm just going to split poles just to split them. You can't split the poles, just one person walking on one side of the pole, the other person walking on the other side. And I'm going to split it every chance I get. Because why? It's the stupidest thing that you'll find out people, something happened, they want to throw salt over their shoulder. The dumbest thing you ever want to do. Why? Because that's what the people do. Thinking that you're doing something and you're doing nothing. The same as Samson thought, all the strength was in his hair. <laughs> so he, so he doing... He doing this hair thing. His hair cut, he look, oh, shit, I don't have no more hair. I'm weak. Buffed out. Buffed out and weak, and now he calls himself weak as I don't know what. But that's, that's Samson. So we looking at this. So this warns us of the potential risk, vulnerability, without discernment, without discernment, while the openness of this vulnerability forming this deep connection that we should have been able to accomplish by wisdom in discernment and guard against these that who might try to take advantage or expose us to these types of states. So Samson life serves as a reminder that we should consider and entrust in our deepest selves and our spiritual gifts. For when they think and they're exposing our vulnerabilities, those without the best interest of our hearts, expectation to doing us harm. So same thing I said, misunderstanding or misinterpretations and what happens exactly what happens to us. So this sharing the authentic selves and understanding the environment. So one, another party have this empathetic or understanding the vulnerabilities might be understood and misinterpreted. Same thing. One of the best ones, one of the best misunderstandings most of us really don't pay attention to, the best misunderstanding we can look at is Joseph. Joseph, who shared his dreams with his brothers, even with his father and mother. Joseph. Why, why am I even saying that? Because Joseph's narrative in, in Genesis 39, you can see even in his narrative what he did. I'm, I'm going to show it to you just so, you so we can all be on the same page. 
besides sitting there talking about it. And um, Genesis 37, and we'll look at five. Uh, yeah, five. So actually it's highlighted too. So I'm going to leave that highlighted. But the main thing is, what, what it showed with Joseph, he shared his dreams. And, and, and what he was did when he was doing this, he's sharing his dream, but then we should not be risking misinterpretation because he was compelled to share his vulnerability, meaning he's, showing, he's sharing his deepest thoughts that, that came to him in the dream. So with that, and it came misinterpretations, and what it is, and, and it had an absence of empathy with Joseph. I'm going to show you that in one second. It had an absence of empathy with Joseph. And, w- and what happened, one, Joseph didn't ask his daddy to be the favorite son. However, he was, the, he was his dad's favorite son because his dad loved Rachel more than he loved Leah. He hated Leah. So when he had these dreams of the greatness, most of the other ones were from there. But then Joseph always telling you about these dreams. His brothers, even his father and mother, he told that dream one time that they going to bow to him. Emboldened by this youthful confidence and sincerity, Joseph shared this dream with his family. But he was making himself, technically, he was making himself vulnerable by revealing the deepest thing that was in his mind and in his soul in the dream that he had. That made him vulnerable. Let me let me show you this. It says in in uh, Genesis chapter thirty seven verse five. It says, and Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him, yet the more. He's telling them something personal. And they oh, ooh, I, I can't stand that Joker. Dude, it was a dream. <laughs> it was a dang dream. But it gets better. And he said unto and he and he said unto them, here I pray you this dream I have dreamed. And remember, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaves arose and also stood upright. And remember, your sheaves stood around about and made up cess to, to my sheaves. And his brethren said unto him, Thou shalt indeed reign over us, and thou shalt indeed have dominion over us. And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. <laughs> I'm telling you. You can't, you can't, you can't make this up. The Joseph brothers, for the lack of empathy, for the lack of empathy, to understand his perspective on what he had dreamed, instead they misconstrued his dream as a testament to ignorance, <laughs> not the prophecy, to ignorance. Their missing, their misinterpretation, fueled by their own insecurities and envy, led them to mischievous, this, this mischievous, this crazy thing. And what did they do? They sold his brother. They sold their own, sold him, sold him into slavery. I want you to think of this is empathy. Okay, you you going I'm gonna sell your butt. <laughs> I'm gonna sell you. You sold. Empathy. That's what we do. See, we good at doing that. We are good, good, good at doing that. And in fact, uh, thinking about another case, just to kind of going off something with the same, same identical, identical thing. We're gonna look at something with uh, Colin Kaepernick. He was a former quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Same thing. See, Kaepernick became not known for just his uh, prowess things in football field. He, 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 he can play some ball. I give him his credit. He can play some ball. But he had this silent protest against racial in, inequality of all these police violence that they, they were doing to black children. And then he even said black and brown children. So what he'll do, he'll kneel rather than stand doing the national anthem. So this gesture that sparked a widespread controversy not just controversy, it, it intense debates. But from Colin Kaepernick's perspective, his actions were not meant to be disrespectful towards the stupid flag out there or you know, the military. It wasn't for that. But it was rather a peaceful protest to draw attention to the racial injustice. What made it worse, he explained his intent. He even explained it. Tell him he's not going to stand up to show pride to a flag for a country 
that oppresses black people and people of color. So to me, he said, to me, this is bigger than football. It would, it would be selfish on my part to look at it another way. So this, these, so these bodies in the streets and people getting paid to leave and getting away with murder, all these things was happening and Colin wasn't having it. So he just said, hey, I can, how can I stand up for a country and this is what they're actually doing? It shows, it shows our ignorance. I'm talking about even if you go to a game, you go to anywhere, people tell you, stand up, put your right hand over. Oh, hell no. I, I, do, I do anything. I said, I won't think nothing about it. Why? What are you going to show proudness for? No, people had this thing. And with the same thing with him, many people in misinterpret his intentions and they saw his actions as what? Unpatriotic and disrespectful towards the military. So this misinterpretation in his action became and it led to a, a, a widespread backlash many calling him all kinds of things and it ended up getting him banned from the nfl banned from the nfl didn't never say a word and resulting to this controversy many has sat there in this in this in this eclipse the original issue with colin kaepernick why and all he was doing was bringing something to light for himself. But guess what? All of us will be just as stupid, just as foolish, just as ignorant, be just as much as a fool to continue to look at football. Why? Because no matter what, you saying, okay, well, they did him, but this is still my team. Well, they did him, but I'm going to still support this football. Hell no, just turn it off. That's the, easiest, that's the easiest way to shut them down. Why you got to look at football? You look at football, that's why I told my wife, I'm going to get into soccer, which is real football. I, that's what I'm going to get into. But as soon as you sit there, you flick on that station, you agree with everybody else who did that to Colin Kaepernick. Care less what, he, what, 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 what color is, but what he stood for. So when you sitting there, oh, well, well, I still got to watch my team. Man, forget the team. Forget them. Don't buy a ticket. Don't buy nothing. That's what you do. So the same thing. Let's go back with Joseph. Let's get back with Joseph. Because this, this, I be done went on another tangent. So with Joseph, his experience offers a critical spiritual lesson. So it highlights this empathy to understand when it makes others themselves vulnerable controversies by just talking about self. It underscores the importance of wisdom, discernment, and when we choose to expose our dreams, our hopes, our innermost thoughts. Actually, let me tell you what that runs me somewhere. Um, let's go to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 4, verse um, 23. 23. It tells us, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it the issues of life. Why? Why, why? why are we looking at this? Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it is the issues of life. The scripture is actually telling us we need to guard our, our, our innermost thoughts, our dreams diligently, indicating that we need for discernment about when and where we to share those with our deeper selves or with deeper with others to avoid misunderstandings of other people just on this alone just on this alone so joseph reminds us of this vulnerability as i just showed you with colin kaepernick so this is the kind of, of of intimacy with a genuine connection requires us to carefully balance with wisdom and discernment and without later are exposed to this state could be misunderstood or misconstrued resulting into hurt and unintentional consequences that didn't have nothing to do with anything. Meaning we're going to have these, having these unhealthy boundaries, unhealthy boundaries, vulnerabilities. These goes on fostering intimacy, the importance of maintaining healthy boundaries, sharing too much too soon. Or what's wrong with people? can lead to uncomfortable situations, even relationships. 
that can be found in relationships that we even seen. One of the best ones you've seen is with King Saul and David. Saul unhealthy attachment lacked the boundaries and led to a jealousy to attempt to even murder David. Think about this. Jealousy. He wanted to murder David. <laughs> Actually, you want to tell you what? I'm telling you. Let's look at something. Let's go to first Samuel chapter 18. And we're gonna look at eight. We're gonna we're gonna tie up in there. Cause I want to show you something. To where where we just all jealousy. He wanted to murder David. And you can read 18 and 19, chapter 18 and 19, you will see Saul was openly going to try to kill David. He was going to knock David off. Let's, 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 I'm just going to hit a few, I'm only going to hit a few, very, but you need to read the whole chapters when you get over into this Old Testament. Because I'm talking about, boy, you, now if you, people don't, I like soap opera. If you like soap opera, if you like real opera, you go in the Bible because you're going to get it there. But let's look at something. It says that Saul was very rough and saying, and saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. What could he have more but the kingdom? This is all he need. He had that. He he wanted, he, no, what, all he needs is the kingdom. So Saul eyed, he eyed David. From that day forth, from that day on, I'm gonna keep my, I'm gonna keep a close eye on this joker. I'm gonna keep a close eye on this joker. But David was a loyal guy. Let's look at this. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 19. We're gonna go to 19:1. And then we're gonna bounce down and then, you know, because this this goes 19 and 1. So watch what happened. And he Saul ain't no joke. He ain't one to be played with. Saul spake to Jonathan his son and, and all his servants. That they should kill David. Y'all need to kill. Well, y'all playing. Y'all need to kill that Joker. He ain't playing. He's dead serious. <laughs> he don't. Hey man, y'all need to kill David. Out of all people, kill yeah, kill David. What we need to kill David. But David, David, Lord, yeah, I know, but kill him. All he needs is the kingdom. So I said, no, kill this Joker. Let's drop down to verse nine. And, and see and, and get a little bit more information. It says, "In the evil spirit, in the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in the house in his javelin, in his hand, and David played with it in his hand." But you you see in here, and Saul sought to smite David even in the walls with the javelin. I'm telling you, he wanted to take David out. But he slipped away out of, out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall. And David fled and escaped that, that, that night. He wanted to take David out. <laughs> I'm telling you, you can't, you can't make this stuff up. You cannot make this up. Just demonstrating the unhealthiness the obsession that lacked boundaries when we, when we do this relationship right here with Saul and David. So same thing, same thing. Let me let me tell you something about even with my brother Dwayne, my brother D. I call him D. So tell you about him. And, and, and people never hear him speak the concerns. It's, now this showing you my brother. This is my own blood brothers. They're showing you he never speaks. You never hear him speak openly. Ever this, he probably get mad even when I when I say this. He never even speak openly the concerns that he, you know, when we was children that he had for me. And now, the worst part is he had more concerns for me now because he voiced them to me. I'm telling, it's crazy. He 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 was my big brother when I was a kid. I'm talking about he, he you boy you 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 playing with your life. You mess with me. Especially when I was five, six, seven, eight, you mess, you playing with your life, cause he he was that he I'm talking about he was like bulldog, but he's worse now. He won't show it. You won't hear him voice it. You won't hear him voice it to you. You'll never even know it. He's real. He's real laid back type guy. But that's him. 
but you he voiced it now, but he'll voice it to me. Cause I mean he done shared some things with me. So the same thing, and this according to the flesh, he's my big brother. According to the spirit, I'm his big brother. But I'm gonna tell you, he he lets you know he's a big brother according to the flesh. Cause he's a whole different cat. But it shows you this 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 thing when you get to this and understanding when you're dealing with someone. So the same thing is on vice versa side. When you're looking at this, you have to understand exactly what is going on. So being the same renewed way and doing these things, we have to understand, we have to respect the world that's around us with the goodness that the wisdom that we possess. So the same thing is if, when we're looking at other things, people can look at stuff ignorantly, intentionally to humble, different things and eager to learn. So you have some people, we actually we go into one guy, we can look at this guy named Eric. So now we can have this guy, just Eric, just, just a little small story just to show you, Eric. He wanted to soak up everything. We go, we call we call this other guy. We're gonna call him Elder Simon. Elder Simon, and and what he wanted to do, he wanted to learn from this guy. So this Eric wanted to learn from this Elder Simon. So as he's teaching, he's like a sponge, outward, showing all this respect, masking his inner ambitions. Actually, what it really is, his inner ambition. He observed, he absorbed, taking in careful notes of the Elder Simon methods, these mannerisms, his teachings. But as time passed, his feelings, he have absorbed enough knowledge. That's most people feel that he absorbed enough knowledge from this Elder Simon. He began to do these dark, these dark, these dark entrails. The true nature started unraveling. Eric started this widespread start spreading lies about this Elder Simon. His, his whispers, twisted tales, his reverence of his teachers, supposed to be wrongdoings, his eager ears, and telling the town folks and towards them showed this respect, then he replaced it with this stealthy campaign to actually slander. So despite hearing Eric, 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 Eric betrayals, because they'll hear it. So as he heard it, he remained calm, composed, his faith unwavering. So the same thing is, most times he, he was always aware that, that that trap that was always set by this guy. So this is the thing you got to remember. Let's look at something in, in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It's telling you, it says, Pride go up before destruction and haughty spirit fall before before fall. Exactly what's going on. So the same thing with this elder Eric and this in this pride of this Eric. And yet this elder Simon. Ill will intentions would eventually fall down. He continued to teach and guide his students in the same way, the same level of dedication, the same wisdom as always as he always did. Never changed. But we have to understand the true nature of this guy, Eric was always there. It was always there. And we'll see this in Psalms, Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27. you see the same thing. Whose digs a pit shall fall therein, and he shall roll a stone, and I will return upon him. Meaning the same thing is many people will sit there and they'll go through these these, these issues. So same thing with this elder Eric, his wisdom. He understood he didn't didn't need to provoke the fall to deceitful person actively. Natural laws plays 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 its part in its time and the truth will still be revealed. No matter what. So the same thing with the restoring balance and the injustice, the teacher is patience, the truth, the maintaining one's integrity, even one faces betrayal and deceit. The same thing as David. It never changes. So we have to understand those. So the same thing is people understand things with, with many people. You'll see many people teach in many different places all over the place. But there's someone there that's always watching, lurking. But if you have the discernment that God given you, you already know who they was right, right when they first came in there. So, so, so it never bothers them. 
So did David know that he wanted to do it? Yeah, David knew it from the beginning. But did they change David? No, they don't change David. So the main thing is we understand what love is, showing the empathy. So another one, we need to find out what this promise, the promise. See, promise is made up and comprised another different way, completely different, but the same thing in many ways, but it's comprised a lot differently. Meaning, meaning this, <clears throat> and we need to write this down, what promise is made of, promise is made of, promise is made one of, of, of commitment, unwavering dedication, determination to uphold one's word or a duty regardless of the circumstances. That's commitment. Commitment 101. Promise. That's why most men, I promise to love, cherish, you know, all that. That's an unwavering dedication, determination to uphold one's word or duty, regardless of the circumstances. So it's the same thing with the spiritual notions of a promise. It's intertwined with the essence of God's divine word emboldened in the wavering truth and assurance a promise that is the course the insurance of a covenant. The same thing, we can see this all the time. Why, why we understand God. We understand God because he tells us some things that we can't get around. We can't get around it. You see it here. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall not he do it, or has he spoken and shall not make it good? He's asking you a question. This emphasizes that the promise, especially from God, is made unyielding truth and reliability. The manifestation of his will, his word. You see, you see right here what he's saying. In fact, uh, we'll we, we couple this to make sure we can't even get around it. Wisdom of Solomon, it says something that's really profound here. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 12, picking it up at verse 19, it's going to tell us even more so here. And you see it, but by which, by such works, thou hast taught thy people that the just man should be merciful. And has made thy children to be a good hope and giveth repentance for sins. Exactly what the point is. This underlines God's promise, his mercy and the repentance serving as an affirmation of hope for his followers. I want you to understand where, where, where he's coming from. You got to understand where God is coming from all the time. His promise is more than mere words. His, his, his promise is not just mere words on paper, but it's more than words. It's a testament of his character, his credibility. It turns a commitment into deliberate and a steadfast decision, and it upholds one's promise, this act in building oneself, emotional and intentional. The course of action of anyone that's in, actually, I'm going to tell you what, that just remind me. Let's look at something. I want to show you this. Make sure you see this. In uh, Luke chapter 16, looking at verse 10. In 16, verse 10. Let's, let's, let's take a close look at this. He that is faithful in that which is least in faithful, also in, also in much. He that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Well, I want you. I want you. I want you to see something because I want. I want to tear that down for you for a second. That's why. So this is showing you. This speak volumes about the seriousness of commitment. One who is committed even to the smallest task, they exhibit a character worthy of larger responsibilities. No matter what, no matter how we look at it, no matter how we flip it, no matter how we script it out. This is why it's so important to really understand always watching who you're learning from. Many people won't always sit there, well, I'm going to go learn. Then you learn over there. That's why I tell you, if you over somewhere else and you, you like to float around in all these places, it's easy you go there because you're going to mix truth and you're not going to get in the kingdom no way because you're mixing, you're mixing this word. In, in Sirach chapter 2, verse 15, it says, they that fear the Lord will not disobey his word. That's taking us right back to the beginning on how we changes it. And they that love him will keep his ways. You see how this is playing out. 
You see, this is starting to come back to what this original state was. I love them that love me. This is why it's starting to get more and more. Now we are starting to put this little clamper down. But this is an excellent illustration that's right here. This testament, this reverence to love God, the Lord. This implies our commitment. God commands a manifestation. He, he commands each and every one of us a manifestation of one's faith and love for him. For him. The commitment for that reason. The spiritual discipline, the testament, the faithfulness, the dedication, the strength. One's commitment reflects. It's going to reflect your character, your faith, your respect, your, 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 your sacredness of a promise to God. I don't know. I don't know. The seriousness of a commitment is the role. It's like a bromometer. Of of uh, of our spiritual more um, uh, more more um, more integrity. It's not merely about honoring a promise, but it's about honoring a relationship with God, and that we're supposed to have with 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 with, his, with those who are His. Trust. Just another one. Ties to promise. Ties to promise. So trust is the firm belief in reliability or truth. Someone or something is an unspoken agreement that the words is given will not be broken. Will not be broken. The sanctity of a promise dwells in the heart to trust. It anchors the spiritual, the anchors the then the build a steadfast belief in relying on truth of someone. In the essence, trust is the cornerstone of a promise. The soil, the seed, the assurance that sold and nourish. Telling you about this. Letting you know about this. Telling you about what you need to do. Actually, better yet, when we get into these promises and we send this, we stand fast with it. You see it here. Psalms 19, I mean, verse 9, chapter 9, verse 10. It says, And they that know thy name, thy way, will put their trust in thee. For the Lord has not forsaken them that seek thee. The Spirit of God has not forsaken them. This is why I don't, tr people, that's why I tell you, y'all over there, visiting all these crazy go there these verses emphasizes the, the instructions and necessaries that, that we have to find with finding and trusting in God this unchanging this unfaltering his promise holds eternal the same thing as he does with his wisdom he's telling us all things on what we should be doing but a lot of us don't like to do it we don't like to do it. We don't like to hold on to what the truth is. It says, they that put their trust in him shall understand the truth. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 3 verse 9. Put your trust in and you will understand the truth. This underlines the importance of trust. For through it, we can understand and discern the truth of his promise. The trust is the unspoken agreement of a spiritual bond that strengthens a promise in the trust that makes the promise something more profound, more significant. It becomes a beacon of hope, the source of comfort, this testament of faith. It's all there. The fabric of a promise is interwoven. The thread of trust, making it durable in the, the resilience, able to withstand the test of a trial of times. Trust. It's through trust we find solace. Hope is his promise. Strength is our faith. 
Hope is his promise. Strength is his is our faith. So thus trust forms the backbone of a promise, giving the substance of death and purpose. What is wrong with us? We go chase everything contrary to God. Everything contrary. Hope is the feeling of expectation, the desire, certain things happen. A promise stirs hope, provides the, the sense of positive anticipation. The promise from God is more than just words. It carries a seed. The seed of what? The seed of hope. Hope is a spiritual sense in the yearning of the heart and the fulfillment that the promise of God as an expectation, the desires and the anticipation is what is being with is with his promise. So the scriptures are filled with promises. They fill with them. The promises that, 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 that instills the profound sense of, of hope in believers, the believers in Christ. And it's showing that his hope isn't empty or it's not baseless but is anchored on the unfailing character of God, his love, his power, his faithfulness. That's what it's on. Just build on this. And we'll see this in Romans 15, verse 13. We'll see this right, right here. It says, now God, now the God of hope, the God of hope, I'm just pausing just, just so, that, so it can marinate on, on each and every one of our membranes. The God of hope fill you with all joy, including peace, and believing that ye may abound in hope when what he has through the power of the Holy Ghost, of the separated body that you get. What part are we missing here? Why do we have to keep sitting there and pound this into craziness? This underscores the hope of God's promise. The joy of peace illustrating the intimate connection between hope and promise. The same thing as he keep telling us all the time and we we, we, we we just do everything. We do everything under the sun. Let's look at something. In Wisdom of Solomon chapter 3 verse 4. It tells us right here even more clearly. It says, For though they be punished in the sight of men, think we not? We down here getting punished like crazy in the in, right in the purpose of men. Yet is their hope Filled with immorality. Yeah, I'm gonna get to the kingdom. You can punish me all day, but Lord, I ain't I ain't moving. You can do whatever you want. I'm 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 rolling with you. Even in times of hardship, the whole springs God promised is not diminished. Rather, it's the beacon of light. Cause He said He chastised who He loved. So the one walking around, how you doing? I'm so blessed. I'm highly favored. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. God ain't nowhere close to you. How you doing? I'm blessed and hardly fireable. God ain't nowhere close to you. Sitting there like, man, I'm just pushing. I'm just pushing, boy. The Lord, he, he been laying, he been laying the smack down. Yeah, yeah. He trying to get us right. We trying to get in the kingdom. You better endure it, endure it to the end. Cause if you endure it to the end, the same shall be saved. We got to understand that. He guides us through the darkest nights. It don't matter. The promise from God does more than offer future assurance, but it provides hope and presents this inner spring strength, this resilience, this preservation, this, this sense, this hope, this vital component, this, this promise, this giving light, this vibrant power, the promise from God. The spiritual vessels that carries hope casting light in the path in the strength 
to resolve our walk in, in faith. But he got another one coupled with this one. Integrity. 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 Yeah, it's a whole different ball game. Integrity is the quality of being honest. Integrity, being honest. Integrity, being honest. Integrity, being honest. And having this strong moral principles. The same moral principles, the promise or testament to one's integrity. Oh yeah, it's right there. Especially the divine promise. It's essential a testament to integrity. It's steadfast, it's adherence to the moral ethical code. Man, why don't you tear that down? No problem, I tear it down. Ain't no problem. Ain't no problem, I tear it down. When when, when God make a promise, everybody with me? Everybody, y'all sleep? I hope y'all ain't sleep. I just, I'm trying to find out, y'all sleep. If y'all sleep, you're going to miss it. See, because when God makes a promise, it's a declaration. When God makes a promise, it's a declaration of his integrity. When God makes a promise, it's a declaration of his integrity. It's an insurance that he will act in the alignment of his character. It's, that's a mic drop. Because his character, which marks the perf this perfect righteousness, this faithfulness in his truth. God one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> the most I got of Israel one on one. Yahweh one on one. When he makes a promise, it's a declaration of his integrity. It's an insurance, the act, the alignment in his character. And it's always marked by his perfection and his beauty, faithfulness, and truth. <laughs> He ain't playing. Scriptures bear witness of his integrity. Why? We just seen it. I'll go right back to it. I'm going to show it right here. I'm going to go right back to it the way you see it. To where we can bear witness to this. Psalm uh, Numbers 23 verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and shall not do it? Or has he spoken and shall not make it good? Yeah. He spoke it. He spoke it. A declaration of his integrity. So the same thing, actually, let me, let me, let, let's build on some of this right now. Let's build on some of this. In Songs of Solomon, we're going to go back over here. In uh, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 12, verse 2. Uh, next we're going verse 20 to well, I'm verse 22 I want this one this is the one I want I want that one it says therefore meaning for that reason whereas do chasing us so for that reason have you ever got your butt beat on I'll tell you what I'm gonna ask, ask y'all a question because this happened to me this happened to me so I just want to know what did happen to you all you gotta do is say I in I for yes in for no have your parents ever whooped you in the streets in your in the presence of your friends? Simple question. Simple question, because it happened to me. It happened to me. I didn't even tell you about me and my brother. I done told y'all that enough. Me and my brother, we, we got our butt whooping right in the stove. See, some people are lucky. You only got a few lucky, only a couple of lucky people. I see only a few lucky ones slipping through here saying no. Y'all lucky. Y'all lucky ones. Y'all, y'all, y'all must, y'all must wasn't hell raisers as much as we was. So yeah, a couple of y'all, a couple of y'all slipped through the cracks. A couple of y'all slipped through the cracks. That's okay. That's all right. Well, I'm just letting you know. It ain't a good feeling. So some of y'all slipped through the cracks. That's okay. If you slip through, that's okay. Cause I'm gonna tell you, we didn't get to slip through the cracks. Y'all should have been friends with us when we were growing up. You, you, I guarantee you would have got, you You, you have a yes on that. Because you would have got your butt toe up. You would have got that butt toe up. But let's read this. 
<laughs> Let's read this. That's all right. I'm looking at it. Yeah, exactly. I still feel some of them too. It says, therefore, whereas thou doest chasing us, thou scourges our enemies. See, he's going to scourge the enemies at a thousand times more. So don't worry about us being chastened. See, some of y'all slipped through the crack, but that's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Hey, I, I ain't tripping, but that's all right. But you got it. But the but the but the the enemies a thousand times more to intend when we judge when we're taught we should carefully think of thy goodness. Yeah, yeah. I really get the whooping than to be than to be than to be sitting there at a cemetery. I rather get the whooping than to be sitting in jail. I rather get the whooping than to be living on the streets. I'd rather get the whooping than to be sitting there handicapped. I'd rather get the whooping than to be anywhere else than where he has me right now. It's enough said for me. So he said, that goodness for when ourselves are judged, we shall look for mercy. Yeah, we, Lord, Lord, boy, please get that belt off of me. Yeah, that's all we can say. But he said, now, I love you, and he, he landed on you. He landed on you, so it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. We, we, we going through this. So when we read this, we can understand it better on what he's talking about when he did this. So this shows us that God acts. He's an act of discipline. He's an act of discipline. Some of y'all just knew what discipline was. And me, all the ones got to know, see, I think y'all just the smart, smart, smart out of kids. Y'all just knew better. See, me and my brother, we wasn't that. We we gon we gonna always go against the grain. So, so all y'all knows, y'all them little know it all kids. See, y'all already knew and y'all was a little bit obedient kids. That's okay. That's all right. I don't have a problem with y'all. See, y'all should y'all should have been friends with me, cause I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. So some of y'all, I'm okay with it. But the thing is. With this discipline, the expression of his integrity is aiming for the growth of our spiritual well-being. So a promise from God, it undergirds the underlying integrity. His divine place to step in unwavering honesty and high moral principle will got us our butt whoopings. That will got us our butt whoopings. It was a promise of a solid character of God. You do it, and I'm going to whoop your butt. We did it, and we got our butt whooped by what? By men. By by, by the sit there, by our parents. We got set right there. Yeah, we beat our butts. So we got to understand what this is. And now with this, this comes with this trust, is completely knowing that the firm that we need to do this perfect integrity. And that integrity, it comes with responsibility. To state two facts. To state two facts, the duty, they're dealing with something that's having control over someone. So when we promise is made, it carries weight of responsibility. So the promise particularly, the promise particularly is, 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 is a, it's a proceeds from God, but it's known with this profound sense of responsibility. It binds the promiser in the promise E. It binds the promiser in the promise E. I want to show you this. I want to show you this real quick to where we can we wind in this on down in uh, Acts. I mean, in Exodus chapter 19, verse five. We need ver yeah, we need verse five. We need verse five. And we're going to see it right here. You're going to see where he got a promiser and we got the promise ease. And he said, he said, now, therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the earth is mine. And he tells Moses that he said, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation because he's going to beat it out of you. Just, just, you know, for all y'all know that's, we we didn't tell. I probably got a couple of y'all beatings knowing that. Probably got a couple of y'all whoopings. But the kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Exactly what he's saying. So I probably got a whooping for a couple of y'all. Probably got a whooping for a couple of y'all. No telling. So this is telling you this promise belongs with the this tremendous responsibility to be part of this Israelite community. That if we obey the voice of God and keep his covenant, 
this responsibility, it shows us exactly what I was saying before. When we're looking at Sirach chapter, um, chapter, chapter 2 and verse 10. And you'll see it here. And it's telling us. It's telling us right up front. It says, look at the generations of old and see. Did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded? Any one of us trusted in the Lord and got confused? Did any one of us trust in the Lord and get confused? <laughs> we answering our own question. And he's sitting there, he's checking us on this. This is the word for it. We're being checked on this. And I have to do it the way to show you we got to get checked. Have he ever trusted in him and then we got confused in any kind of way? But he said something better. He said, or did any abide in his fear, in his desire? So did any of us abide in his fear, in his desire, and was forsaken? So if you abided in his desire, were you forsaken for it? You see how we kind of getting checked? Each and every one of us getting checked. See, now we're already good at two people. See, we got some goody two shoes. See, y'all just didn't get them whooping. See, them, that's, that's what I got a pet peeve about. Y'all didn't get them open. Y'all didn't get them on the street whooping. I got them on the street whooping. I'm still, I'm still kind of scarred by in that. I might, have to go, I might have to go to counseling for it. I might got to go to counseling for that. But the main thing here is, have you ever abided in the desire of God and you was forsaken for it? No, you wasn't forsaken for it. He said, or whom did ever despise that called upon him? He, I'm talking about he, he's, landed, he's laying this down for us. So as it reads, we can come up with this because God is faithful. He's persistent. The essence of God promises embodies the commitment on what we're doing. Unwavering faithfulness demonstrates his his in this impeaceable, this impeaceable integrity, the cultivation of responsibility of his promise. So when we comprehend a promise, the comprehensive sense is not just to appreciate the depth of God's love and the fidelity, but it recognizes our part in the divine this 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 flesh relationship that we share the responsibility with the faithfulness to execute that ensures the promise manifests in God's perfect timing this is what it's doing and we have to have one other part tied to this we have to have consistency 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 meaning we have to stand fast and adhere to the same principles the course or the form the promises require consistency they're worth credibility. so to sum all this up love and promise with their different natures shares the common elements like the commitment manifesting the the unique intertwined ways in, in our life, they are both comprised in intangible yet powerful elements that build and deepen on our relationship, shapes our perceptions, our influences, our actions. The promises requires, promises requires consistency, both from God, we already know we're going to take care of his end, but then those who promise are made too. And those promises are made to us. And this for this lasting faithfulness, this course that has right through here. Show you, let me show you this as we close them down there. In uh, 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verse 12, it tells you, it says, it tells us right here, it says here, it says, And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up a seed after thee, and thou shalt proceed out of thy bowels, and thou shalt establish his kingdom. But it gets better. And he shall build a house in my way and I will establish the throne in his kingdom forever. That's a beautiful thing. This promise to the lineage of David instead to establish the kingdom forever, it takes us right back over here to the, to the same thing we've been pumping the entire time. In Wisdom of Solomon, we've been pumping this the entire time. Chapter 12, looking at verse 22. It says, For whereas thou do chasten us and scourge us the enemies and thou a thousand times more, so we ain't got to worry about a lot of stuff. We ain't got to worry about a lot of stuff. But this is a testament to the action, this unwavering dedication, this promise that God has. So our part, our part, we got to remember what God is about. Our part. And the same thing is we got to trust God. We got to trust God. 
So on our part, God's promise required consistency and faith and obedience. So you will see this right here as we're closing down. And we'll see this in, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. It says, I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thee a great and Nathan, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And he says even more right here, he says, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. That's why he said a thousand times more. He's going to hook them up a thousand times more. And he says, in, in, uh, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. He's, he's right, right up front. So as we see this here, as we see this here, we, we go through. So this intertwining elements, this commitment, this, 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 this trust, this hope, this integrity, this responsibility, this consistency, it illuminated by God interactions with Israel. With Israel. This, this interactions. That we got to understand what's going on. So with this, we just want to understand what is happening with each and every one of us. We just want to understand when we get into this commitment with God to understand this intertwining element, this promise, this commitment, this trust, this integrity, the responsibility that we got to have with him. So we remember that God created the heavens and the earth on a promise of love, on a promise of love. The utterance of his voice was not vain at all. The utterance of his voice was not vain, but it achieved what he desires. Just as when a teacher gives instruction to her students or to his students, through the scriptures we can consider God's creation in heaven and earth is profound of love and birth his promise to provide his creation. To provide for them. Show you something. I want to show you something. Make sure, make sure we clear all this. And we'll find this in Jeremiah chapter 31. We'll see this here, 35. And, and the reason why I want to show you this, because what I was saying. Because he precisely intended, and it aligns his love, his teaching, his instruction, same as for his students. So we can reflect on this. And you see it here, it says, Thus said the Lord, which giveth the sun by day, because he, he promised it by day, and the ordinances of the moon, and, his, and the lights for by night, which divided the sea, and the waves thereof roar, the Lord of hosts is his way. He promised this. And it's happening right now as we see it. And he's telling you right up front, If those ordinances depart from before me, said the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. See, we wasn't spread all over the world for just disobedience, but it's the easiest way because it makes it impossible for them to destroy Israel. So don't think that we spread it because we were spread for his sakes because a lot of people would sit there. We was all sitting there. If all Israel was just sitting in Jerusalem, they can easily destroy that one place and destroy all Israel. But we are all over the world. We everywhere. Makes it impossible for them to do it. These things you got to remember and why, why it goes that way. God sees his enduring promise to love Israel. Just as he established the sun and the moon, the stars and the sun wavering ordinances and, and the delicate things on their operation. We have to remember this. Making this same powerful analogy, it's echoing the same as last verse. I actually want to run to. Um, I, I got two more. I actually want to do because I'm thinking about it. So I need to stop doing so much thinking sometimes because it's running. It'll keep running me to other verses. Um, actually, I went one too high. I believe it's eleven. Yeah. It's 11, uh, I want Toby chapter 13, verse 8. It says, Many nations shall come from afar to the way of the, the Lord God with gifts in their hand, even the gifts to the king of heaven. All generations shall praise thee with a great joy. Yeah, exactly the point. Exactly what the point is. Many of them going to come before him. So as we see God promises, 
his act, his eternal testament, his love, showing his commitment, his trust, his hope, his integrity, responsibility, his consistency to his creations. Such as unwavering certainty speaks the heart of God's promise, his love, both which is built on the firm foundation of his divine character. The power of his word is not only birthed on creation, but it also maintains and it stands and is steadfast on the promise. It is unending love. So as we can imagine, just like playing the game of Simon Says, it's a set of rules. Everyone that follows. The sun shines brightly and the day becomes bright. Brightly day because God commanded so. The moon and like the stars twinkle at night, the seas roar because God has set these rules and they obey. So we need to consider the precision, the celestial mechanics, the sun reliability as it rises each day, the moon waxes and winds in predictable cycle. These occurrences dedicated to unchanging law of nature can be seen the same thing as this parable that we see in this law of life. This unwavering covenant with the people, with the people of God, His promise, this this, this dependability, as the sun rises, is consistent with the receding waters that flows in the tides and during pledge, echoing through this space. So as we winding down this 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 lesson, I want you to remember two verses that God laid down this and blue this 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 and this, and, this and irrefutable blueprint irrefutable and I want you to keep this in mind and never forget this because this this interconnectedness this promise that he had demonstrates the blueprint this creation this unwavering commitment that people seeing that sending his son which was Yahweh the Messiah but he sent forth his word with the surety of his promise he said this here in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is wrapped in a promise. It's wrapped in one promise. So this scripture, we find a profound fusion of love, promise, where God's commitment is sealed in the ultimate act of sacrificial love. Furthermore, you'll see in this last one that I want to show you. In Wisdom of Solomon, we see it in chapter 3, verse 9. He tells us the same thing. He said, They that put their trust in him shall understand the truth. Here again, faithful and love or promise, understood grace, mercy, and divine care, reinforcing, intertwines the nature of God, love, and, and promise. So love in God's divine blueprint, not fleeing emotions, but deeply rooted in his character, manifested through his promise, the reflection of his steadfast, his reliability, his, in, his, in, his enduring faithfulness of his word. Similarly with the promise, the divine perspective isn't merely is is um, the future commitment, but is expressing love as a testament of the faithfulness, a seed hope that is is a, is a pillar of integrity, emboldened in the responsibility. So with this, I'm gonna leave you with this here, and we'll find this in our First John, chapter four, verse seven. And this is where we'll stop here. Promise one. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of, of God and knoweth God. So as we understand this and we go through this, we can keep that right there. The blueprint. This is the essence of the understanding of love and promise as one, as the lens of the divine blueprint that we show unto God. Okay. Um, 
Well, see, now I'm going to have to go in the back. Uh, I have um, my wife. She has a question. So I'm going to let me uh, set this up real quick. And let me set this up real quick. And then uh, we'll finish out what we're doing here. So let me get this real quick. Um, we'll do this one second. Let me take this. Uh, give me one second, you guys. One quick second. And in the same as um, this evening, we will be having um class today so so make sure that you, if you uh, if you're looking for being part of that we do have uh, the uh, uh, I might have to take all of that out let me take out part of that there we go so most of you guys, you guys will see the link. If you refresh, you'll see the link in there right now for the Zoom. So we can uh, be able to get that. So uh, so if you if you want that there, you can get that there. So the same thing as I was saying, you know, we uh, we will be tomorrow. We will be uh, having the, the the lesson for um for old foolish Galatians. We will be going through that, but we'll be doing that over at from Sinai to today. That will be there, so you will be able to see that there. But you have to go to Sinai to today. You can see that there. And then if you um if you're looking um to go anywhere other than that one, the same thing will be on next week. We'll be at uh, the Deathbed Repentance that'll be showing on King James Bible University. You'll see that there. So you can make sure that you'll be a part of that one. And the same thing is if um, you're looking for the book, you can purchase it after this evening. You can actually get that on Amazon, which is the rare, unique Hebrew names, which these are names, actually many of them, actually 99% of them is from the Atlantic slave trade. And all I did, I took the time took a few years to take the time to make sure I restored their, not just their names, but their meanings to the names. So if you'd like to see that, you can get it there on uh, Amazon, I believe for $20, $20 and it's there. So with that, if anybody want to go into the uh, to the Zoom class, make sure that uh, you can uh, see it in the bottom, you refresh, you'll see the link that is there. So other than that, class will be this afternoon you guys will be receiving the link so until then i'll see each and every person so until next time i say shalom